Last time, we talked about RNA virus genome synthesis and mRNA synthesis. Today we're going to, for the next two sessions actually, we're going to talk about what DNA viruses do. And today we're going to focus on the process called transcription and RNA processing. So here is our Baltimore scheme to put things in perspective. And at the middle, of course, is messenger RNA. And today we're going to talk about a process carried out by the viruses that are shown in red. And they all end up with double-stranded DNA at some point in their rep reproductive cycles. Now, there are some viruses, of course, which have double-stranded DNA in the virus particle, and those include adenoviruses, herpes simplex, polyoma, and papillomaviruses. We've touched on those a bit already. We'll touch on them some more. What's in common today is all the viruses, with one exception, have DNA in the virus particle. But some viruses don't have double-stranded DNA. They have single-stranded DNA, the parvoviruses. Some of them have gapped double-stranded DNA, the hepatitis B viruses. And then we have the retroviruses, which don't have DNA in the virus particle. We would call them RNA viruses. But they produce a DNA copy of their RNA, and that is what drives the reproductive cycle. Now, a number of you seem to think that this is a property of all viruses, all RNA viruses. It's not. Going from RNA to a DNA genome is the property of retroviruses. That's the reversal of the normal flow of genetic information, right, which is DNA to RNA. Retroviruses reverse it, RNA to DNA. It's unique to that class of viruses. So retroviruses have plus-strand RNA in their particle. Uh, they go through a, first a minus-strand, single-strand DNA, and that becomes double-stranded. And the process we're going to talk about today is the process of going from a double-stranded DNA to messenger RNA, that's what transcription is. So historically, transcription is making mRNA from DNA, double-stranded DNA. It is only double-stranded DNA that can be a substrate for transcription. None of the single-stranded DNA, the gapped uh, double-stranded DNA, those cannot be substrates for transcription. And we'll talk about how to get around that issue today. Only double-stranded DNA can be the substrate for the synthesis of mRNA. Now, transcription has a broad use these days. You will see people talking about the synthesis of mRNA from RNA viruses as transcription, whether it be poliovirus where the mRNA is the same as the genome, or vesicular stomatitis virus where mRNAs are much smaller than the genome. Some people call that transcription. I don't because historically this is what transcription is, DNA to mRNA. But you'll see it in the literature as transcription, so beware. When I talk about transcription, it just means the synthesis of mRNA from a double-stranded DNA template. All right, so all of these viruses have this step in common. The retroviruses, the double-stranded DNA viruses, the single-stranded DNA, the gap DNA viruses, they all go to double-stranded DNA, and then they make mRNA to produce proteins to drive, of course, the replication cycle. When a DNA virus gets into a cell, eventually they're going to reproduce their DNA genome, of course, much like the RNA viruses reproduce their genomes, as we talked about last time. You need at least one viral protein made, sometimes many viral proteins, to drive DNA replication. And what I mean by DNA replication, we'll talk about that on Wednesday, taking a DNA molecule and making another one from it, whether it's single-stranded or double-stranded, making more DNA molecules. So in cells with infected with DNA viruses, you need, before you can do DNA replication, you need to make at least one protein. And to do that, of course, you need to make an, a messenger RNA. And so most of the time, the first event that occurs in cells infected with DNA viruses is the production of mRNA transcription, the synthesis of one or more proteins, and eventually DNA replication occurs. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little today. 
However, not all DNA templates are ready for transcription. You already got an example of that previously. Single-stranded DNAs are not ready for transcription. Neither are gapped double-stranded DNAs. Neither are the RNAs of retroviruses. They're RNA. They're not ready for transcription. So these templates have to be gotten ready. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, here's a reproductive cycle of SV40, a polyoma virus. It was one of our viruses we're going to use as a model. And this virus binds receptors. It, it's taken up by a kind of endocytosis called caviolin dependent endocytosis. Instead of clathrin coding the endosome, it's a different protein. Uh, and this is an unusual endocytosis because the endosomes target the endoplasmic reticulum, as you can see here. And they deliver the SV40 particle uh, into the ER. Uh, these are naked icosahedral particles. So the particle goes in the ER, and then eventually the DNA gets in the nucleus. And there it is. It looks a little unusual because it's covered with nucleosomes. And this is one of the few DNA viruses whose DNA in the particle is actually wrapped up in nucleosomes. And that DNA is double-stranded. The DNA itself is shown on the right. It's a circular double-stranded DNA. It's ready for transcription. So that's one of the viruses that can be immediately transcribed. And you can see on this scheme, immediately in the nucleus, an mRNA is made. And that's shipped out into the cytoplasm to start the replicative cycle. So this DNA virus is ready for transcription. Many of them are not. As we said, the hepatinovirus genome is gapped. It has a piece of RNA on it. It also has a small protein linked to one of the DNA strands. You cannot transcribe this DNA. You cannot make mRNA from it. It will not work. It has to be repaired, and that's carried out by the cell. The cell takes this DNA, it removes the protein, removes the RNA, and it fills in the gap. We call that DNA repair. It's not reproduction. It's not making a new DNA molecule. It's just fixing what comes in. You end up with a double-stranded, closed circular DNA molecule, and then that can be used for transcription. Same with the viruses with single-stranded DNA genomes. They cannot be transcribed. They have to be made double-stranded. So this, again, these go into the nucleus. The cell fills in the gap. We'll call that DNA synthesis because it's making this strand. And now we have a double-stranded DNA which can serve as the substrate for transcription. This DNA will not replicate until one viral protein is made. So right now we're not replicating. I want to make that distinction. All these genomes, the, the PADNA and the PARVA, will not replicate until at least one viral protein is made. So this is not genome replication. This is getting the templates ready for transcription. And finally, we have the retrovirus genome, which is, of course, a plus-strand RNA. It's in a nucleocapsid in the envelope virus. When this virus enters a cell, the RNA is not released into the cytoplasm, so it is not translated for that reason. Instead, these viruses come in the cell with an enzyme reverse transcriptase, which eventually makes a double-stranded DNA copy of that genome, which of course uh, is, can be transcribed. However, this one first integrates into cellular chromosomal DNA, and then it is transcribed to make viral mRNAs to code for proteins that are needed for replication. So all of these three groups of viruses, their genomes are not ready for transcription. They have to be converted to double-stranded DNA. Then you'll get some mRNAs made, you'll get some proteins made, and then and only then can DNA replication occur. So that's an important distinction there. Which viral genomes do not need conversion? SV40, the polyoma viruses that I just talked to you about, adenovirus, herpes simplex virus, any virus with a double-stranded DNA genome, whether it's linear or circular, they're ready for transcription. But these others have to be repaired first. So an important way for you to think is remember, double-stranded DNA is the only substrate for transcription. So if a virus doesn't have it, that DNA has to be repaired first. So back here again to our scheme, just to remind you, we have our viruses with DNA genomes. We're going to get them to double-stranded DNA. The retroviruses will eventually get to double-stranded DNA. We'll, we'll talk about that process, which is really interesting in a lecture of its own.
later on. And then uh, these viruses can undergo transcription, the synthesis of mRNA from DNA. So let's look at that process. Uh, first of all, what are the enzymes that carry it out? Here are three cellular enzymes that are involved in making RNAs of different kinds from DNA templates. The one that we mostly talk about is RNA polymerase II. So this is, these are all DNA-dependent RNA polymerases. They're from the cell. They're in the nucleus because that's where we need to make our RNAs. And RNA pol II, you can see here, makes what we call pre-mRNA. It doesn't actually make mRNA. mRNA is defined as the mature molecule which has been spliced and capped and polyadenylated. That's mRNA. That's not made by this enzyme. It makes a pre-mRNA. Uh, it also makes some uh, precursors to microRNAs and small nuclear RNAs. So in the cell, this enzyme makes our mRNAs for us, pre-mRNAs. It does so for viruses as well. And as we'll see later, uh, this Paul II also uh, replicates the genome of hepatitis delta virus. There are other, two other polymerases in the cell, Paul I, which makes the precursor to our ribosomal RNA. As far as we know, it doesn't copy any viral genomes. And then we have Paul III, which makes precursors to a variety of cellular RNAs, tRNAs, for example, smaller ribosomal RNAs. And it is responsible for making some small uh, viral RNAs, not messenger RNAs, though. For the most part, the viruses that go into the nucleus, they utilize host cell RNA polymerase, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. They may modify its activity by making ancillary proteins, as we'll see in a moment. But the viruses that go in the nucleus, they don't encode an RNA polymerase. However, some viruses do replicate in the cytoplasm, pox viruses and some of those giant DNA viruses that we mentioned earlier, they don't go into the nucleus. So there's no way for them to access the RNA polymerase that's in the nucleus. So they have to encode their own DNA-dependent RNA polymerase because they set up shop uh, in the cytoplasm. Uh, for most of what we're going to talk about, we'll be talking about RNA pol 2 making precursors to messenger RNAs. Now here's the process by which we make a mature messenger RNA. It starts in the nucleus where we have a double-stranded DNA substrate, of course, right? It has to be double-stranded DNA. And on the slides I'm going to be showing you, I'll have these red arrows. And these are sites for the initiation of transcription, initiation of messenger RNA synthesis. And we have synthesis of a capped RNA, a pre-mRNA, which is longer from, in most cases than what the final mRNA will be because it has intervening sequences or introns. And of course, the convention for our mRNA is always green, so the introns are a different color. They're going to be spliced out. They're going to be removed by splicing in a process that we'll talk about in a bit. That was discovered in virus-infected cells. So the mRNAs are capped. Uh, they are also polyadenylated. Poly A is added to the 3 prime end. And then they are exported uh, from the nucleus into the cytoplasm where they can be translated. So the very first transcript made from the DNA is called the pre-mRNA. It's not yet mRNA. It's not mRNA until it's capped, spliced, and polyadenylated. As you'll see later, the splicing process is what marks mRNAs for export. But there are many viral mRNAs that are not spliced. And that one of them is shown here. Some viral genomes and mRNA get exported without being spliced. And how that happens, we're going to explore later. That's an interesting conundrum because in our cells, unless you're spliced, you don't get out of the nucleus. So here we have a process of making messenger RNAs. I'm going to go through some of these steps with a focus on what viruses do to make it uh, unique. So first of all, transcription is highly regulated because you don't want it to be full on in every cell at every time. Sometimes you need a lot of mRNAs, sometimes you don't. So it's highly regulated and there are lots of proteins and sequences on the DNA that are involved. And so for example, here on the top, I'm showing you a DNA sequence. On the right, the red arrow is our transcription initiation site. 
So that, by definition, means is plus one means that's where the first base of the RNA is going to start. And you can see all sorts of different colors here for different kinds of sequences. Uh, the, the yellow uh, is what we call an initiator sequence. It's a sequence around the promoter of the RNA. So the promoter is part of this region that promotes RNA synthesis. It has an initiator sequence. And you can see the scale here, 20 to 35 base pairs. We have what's called the Tata sequence, which binds a protein uh, called TF2D, which is important for transcription. And that constitutes uh, what we call the, the core promoter. We have local regulatory sequences that bind other proteins involved uh, in transcription. Uh, and then there are distant regulatory sequences as well, like enhancers or silencers that can be up to 10,000 bases away and still regulate transcription in a positive uh, or negative fashion. So basically, these are mostly DNA sequences that bind different regulatory proteins to modulate transcription. So transcription doesn't happen with just Paul 2 Paul 2 is the enzyme involved, but the complex that does the transcription, all the regulation, depends on lots of other proteins. And that's mainly evolved so the process uh, can be regulated. So if we look at some viral DNAs here on the top, adenovirus in the middle, SV40, uh, another adenovirus DNA in the bottom, these are just illustrating three different promoters in these viral DNAs. And you can see already, Adeno has two at least. It has what we call a major late and an early. So this should tell you right away that different things are happening during the replication cycle. And we'll explore this a bit. Uh, and then in SV40, early promoter. And so these are diagrams of the regulatory sequences. We have the transcription start site. Uh, on the right there, and you can see for the ad late, there's one, and then there are multiple start sites for the other two promoters, so it can get very complicated. And you can see the colors are different, so there are different protein binding sites in all these three promoters. And these have evolved this way because these viruses infect different kinds of cells. They need different kinds of regulation to carry out their reproductive cycles. So a part of that is regulating how much mRNA is made and when in the replication cycle. And so these kinds of regulatory sequences do that. Now, I would never tell you to memorize any of these. The point here is simply that you can regulate this process of transcription by sequences that surround the promoter, which involve proteins that uh, interact with those sequences. And they're different from virus to virus, because as you can imagine, you know, one virus infects respiratory cells, the other virus infects intestinal cells. To regulate transcription, they need to have different protein binding sites in the promoter. So that's why these are all different. So here's a picture or a drawing of a RNA polymerase. See, RNA pol 2 it's in brown. And it's lost in this picture because there's so many other proteins involved. This is what we call the initiation complex. It has formed at the promoter, you can see the red promoter arrow and the initiator, the yellow sequence there underneath it. And all of these proteins are important for RNA Paul 2 to start initiating. Paul 2 alone will not do the job. All these other proteins are important and you can see many different individual proteins. Again, the names of them are not important. They specify initiation and they can be regulated in various fashions. This diagram in particular is illustrating how the enhancer works. So the enhancer on this DNA is this uh, orange sequence, which can be very far away, up to 10,000 bases away. It's position independent. It can actually be flipped around and it still works. And for many years, it was a puzzle how these worked so far away. But it turns out that there are proteins that bind this enhancer. So they bind the DNA. The DNA loops around, they bind the enhancer, and they bind the in, some of the proteins in the initiation complex as well. And this makes the complex bind more tightly, and it enhances the initiation process. It helps the polymerase get to where it wants to be. And you can remove these enhancers from the DNAs, and you can show that initiation efficiency goes down. So lots of viral promoters have these enhancers as well. But as you can guess, there are also silencers that are far away like this to, to dampen initiation. There may be circumstances where you don't need a lot of transcription in a certain cell type in there the silencer would work as well. Now let's talk just a bit about the proteins 
involved in regulating transcription. This, of course, regulation of transcription is crucial for our development, but this is a virology course, so it's also important for regulating the viral replication cycle. We're going to see why in a few moments, but just to preempt, you don't want a virus to go in and make every protein all at once that it encodes. That would be wasteful because what's the point of making capsid proteins right away when you don't have any DNA or RNA to encapsidate later? So there's always a regulation of the replicative cycle. And these proteins can help to do that. And these can be viral or host proteins in a virus-infected cell. If so, for example, there are proteins that we call sequence-specific DNA binding proteins. They have evolved to bind those colored regions on the promoter area of the DNA. They will bind it specifically and help assemble an initiation complex or regulate its activity in some way. They can be host or they can be viral, of course. And remember, you just think of the simplest viral DNA coming into a cell, SV40. It's coming in as a pretty much a naked DNA. It's got histones on it, but the promoters have to be recognized by the cell machinery. They could modify it later by making viral proteins, but many viruses, the promoters have to be recognized on coming in the cell. So the cell proteins have to be able to work on that. So bi DNA binding proteins are a big part of regulation of transcription, but also what we call viral coactivating molecules. These are, again, they can be viral or host cell proteins. They regulate transcription. They regulate the amount of mRNA that's made, but they don't bind DNA. And how do they work then if they don't buy DNA? Well, many of them modulate the structure of the nucleosomal template. In the nucleus, our DNA, and that of any virus DNA that gets in there, is wrapped up around nucleosomes, as you can see here. So our chromosomes look like this. SV40 is, is already wrapped up around nucleosomes in the particle, which, as I said, is unusual. But many other DNA viruses are naked in the particle, or at least not associated with nucleosomes. But when they come in the nucleus, they are immediately what we call chromatinized. Chromatin proteins bind to those DNAs, and they become wrapped around nucleosomes. I think you may know that if DNA is very tightly wrapped around a nucleosome, as shown here, it's hard to transcribe it. So we've learned that in order to get efficient transcription, we have to loosen up the DNA, and that can be done by chemical, chemically modifying uh, the histones or the DNA. And so that's what some of these coactivators do. They modulate how tight chromatin is to allow transcription or inhibit it. And we'll see an example of that in a bit. So we have DNA binding proteins and coactivators that help regulate transcription. So here's an, a diagram of a typical uh, DNA binding protein. We call these sequence specific transcriptional activators. They're typically modular. They consist, of course, of a DNA binding domain that has to bind DNA. Uh, so uh, one DNA binding protein will re recognize a specific DNA sequence, but not a, one that binds a different protein. These proteins also have a module that causes it to form dimers. Many of these activators work as dimers, so you have a dimerization domain. And then at the end, we have what's called an activation domain, which is that part which interacts with other proteins in the transcription complex and recruits them to the DNA. So that's an example of a sequence-specific transcriptional activator. We'll take a look at the co-activators uh, later on uh, when we talk about a specific virus reproductive cycle. What is the first biosynthetic event that occurs in cells infected with double-stranded DNA viruses? Membrane fusion, transcription, DNA replication, protein synthesis, or all of the above. Most of you got B, which is transcription. Biosynthetic event. So membrane fusion, it's not, you're not really synthesizing anything. DNA replication would be a biosynthetic event, but first you have to do mRNA synthesis, and you can't do protein synthesis until you have an mRNA, so it's not all of the above. That's a little tricky, biosynthetic event, but DNA replication means making new molecules, so it's not... Anyway, this is a double-stranded DNA virus. If I said a single-stranded DNA virus, you might get confused. 
And if I had offered, say, DNA repair as one of the options, that could, that could work. I want to talk about three different tra strategies of viral transcription going from simple to more complicated viruses. First, I want to over give you an overview of what components are involved and where do they come from. So here we have a table which has on the left origin of the transcriptional components. Uh, that is the RNA polymerase, the, the transcription proteins that regulate transcription, and then on the right we have different virus examples. So the first one, the origin of the transcriptional component is all, all host, and that's retroviruses with simple genomes. You're going to see later what that means, but there are two broad classes of retroviruses which have just a few proteins encoded in their genomes and others with complicated genomes with lots of proteins like HIV. So retroviruses like HIV do encode transcriptional proteins that modulate the process, but the retroviruses with simple genomes don't. They depend on the host cell to provide everything. So the host does it all for those viruses, RNA polymerase, as well as all the transcription factors. And then we have the host plus one viral protein that regulates transcription. And now there we have complex retroviruses, parvoviruses, single-stranded DNA viruses, papilloma and polyomaviruses, double-stranded DNA viruses. So again, the, everything from the host, including the RNA polymerase II and all the transcription factors, and one viral protein to orchestrate that. And you'll see in a moment how this orchestration works. And then we have host plus more than one viral protein. So you have several viral proteins, adenoviruses and herpes viruses, encode more than one protein that modulates transcription. And finally, everything is viral. Isn't that a movie or something? Everything is awesome, right? That was a, the Lego movie, right? Everything is viral here. The RNA polymerase, all the transcription factors, and that's for the pox viruses and the giant viruses because they replicate in the cytoplasm. They cannot access the nucleus, so they have to encode everything. So that's a good way to look at it. It makes perfect sense that those viruses would need to encode everything. Inherent in this is the idea that if a DNA, a viral DNA comes into the cell with no proteins in it or around it, then that promoter of that DNA would have to be recognized by the host cell. And we're going to see how that works. We're going to see an example of that. The virus, of course, could make proteins that enhance recognition of the promoter. We'll see an example of that. And we also see an example where the viral promoter is poorly recognized by the host cell. So the virus, what do you think the virus does? It brings in a protein in the capsid to make its promoters recognized by the host cell. It's kind of like RNA viruses that have to bring in negative strand RNA viruses that have to bring in RNA polymerases because the cell doesn't have it. So some DNA viruses, the promoters aren't recognized by the host cell, so they bring in a protein to kickstart that. So we're going to look at all this. So here is a overview of some of the schemes that we're going to be looking at for three different viruses. This is how we can regulate transcription using viral proteins. And there are two schemes here. The top, we have what we call a positive autoregulatory loop. So here we have a viral DNA labeled there. It has a promoter on the left side in yellow. The transcription start site is in red. And the mRNA, an mRNA for gene X, let's say. So this DNA comes in the cell. The promoter is recognized by the host cell transcriptional machinery. You get a viral mRNA made that's translated into a protein. And that protein, protein X, actually is some kind of a transcriptional regulator. It will then stimulate transcription at the same promoter to make more mRNAs. And then you get lots of mRNAs and lots of protein X, as you can see there. So that's a positive autoregulatory loop. So basically, the viral promoter works, but it doesn't work well enough to drive replication. So a product that's made will enhance the transcriptional activity at that promoter. But the key here, of course, is this promoter is recognized initially by cellular components. The viral protein makes it better, makes it more efficient. Now, you can also have negative autoregulatory loops here because maybe you have to downregulate a protein later on in replication. Maybe you don't need a transcriptional activator later on, so you can have negative autoregulatory loops. 
Okay, so that's one kind of scheme we're going we're to see in our specific examples. And then at the bottom, we have what we call cascade regulation. So here we have a viral DNA, and now we have two promoters uh, driving mRNA for gene X and gene Y. So the viral DNA comes in, a promoter for gene X is recognized by cellular components. You get an mRNA made, you have a protein X produced, and that protein then is required for transcription at the promoter for gene Y. So gene Y will not be transcribed until protein X is made. So that's why it's called cascade regulation. And we're going to see an example of a two cascade and a three cascade series in two different viruses. Now, why would you want to do this? Again, you don't want to make everything at once. Sometimes you have to delay proteins that are made and you have a re reproductive phase with two phases, an early or a late, and sometimes you have an immediate early and early and a late phase, three phases. So it's all about regulation because you don't want to make proteins when you don't need them. At least that's our human interpretation. If you mess with this, it, re it reduces the efficiency of viral reproduction. What do I mean by messing? Let's say you take away this regulation so that a viral genome goes in and makes all the proteins at once. That is bad. We know that. Those experiments have been done. You get lower virus yields. So there is an advantage to this timing. So let's start with a simple example, SV40, a polyomavirus that we've mentioned. We're going to look at this even more when we talk about DNA synthesis. It's been a model organism for many years. The genome is a circular double-stranded DNA. It's about 8,000 bases of double-stranded DNA in length, so not too big. And before we could purify any DNA from host cells, people were able to easily purify SV40 DNA because all you had to do was grow up virus and purify the particles, and you'd have pure double-stranded DNA. And a lot of people took advantage of that. The SV40 transcriptional program is relatively simple. It is divided into an early and a late phase. So at the top, we have a timeline showing you the transcriptional program. Uh, we have an early phase and a late phase. And this is reflected in the synthesis of two different kinds of mRNAs, early and late mRNAs. So at the bottom is a diagram of the viral DNA. And you can see at the top is labeled ORI. That stands for origin of replication. As we'll see next time, that's where DNA synthesis begins. It's also the site of transcription for the early and the late messages. And the early messages are transcribed in one direction on one strand and the late on the other. And they both start at the origin. So this is a very multifunctional piece of DNA. So what happens here is these viral DNAs get into the cell. Remember the scheme we showed earlier. We're going to see it in a moment. They get in the cell, and there is an early promoter at the origin, which is recognized reasonably well by cellular transcriptional machinery. And you have the synthesis of a single mRNA encoding this protein, LT. It's called large T or T antigen. We'll come back to this many times. That protein is the one protein you need to drive DNA replication of this virus. Remember, I said at the beginning, all viruses need at least one, sometimes more proteins to drive DNA replication. Large T antigen is it. So the early phase is before DNA replication begins. And DNA replication is often the major dividing line between early and late phases. And on this timeline here, you can see viral DNA synthesis is this purple bar that divides the early and late phase. So early phase is before DNA replication. Late phase is after DNA replication has begun. So early on, you don't need to make capsid proteins. Why would you make them? Because you don't have DNA to package them yet. So you have no capsid proteins made early on. You have large T only, and large T is going to uh, stimulate the production of late messenger RNAs. And then the late messenger RNAs are going to encode the capsid proteins. At the same time, large T will stimulate viral DNA synthesis. It is an origin binding protein that says to the host cell, give me your DNA polymerase. 
and recruits it so that the DNA can be replicated. So large T is the one protein that this virus needs to replicate its genome. It's made early, so it gets DNA synthesis started. And then once DNA synthesis begins, we're in late phase, then a large T also stimulates late mRNA production, which encode the capsid protein. So that's the overall transcriptional program, relatively simple, as you'll see compared to what we get into next. Now, you may be thinking, how do you get early and late mRNAs, and you've only got this large T protein made, how does it work? Well, actually, it involves a cellular protein. Uh, at the top, we have the early phase of SV40 replication. We have the early promoter, that's the red arrow there. And um, in the cell, there is a protein called IBP, initiator binding protein. This is a cellular protein that happens to bind to sequences uh, in the uh, late promoter region and prevents them from being transcribed. So at the very top here, you see the early promoter is working but with the IBP around, and this IBP is already in the cell when the virus comes in. We all make uh, this protein. These IBPs all bind uh, control sequences around the late promoter, so the late promoter doesn't work. As we move into DNA synthesis, stimulated by large T antigen, you get more and more and more viral genomes. And with the fixed amount of IBP, eventually you have more DNAs than there is IBP. So then you have a situation where there are not enough IBPs to bind, and therefore the late promoter gets turned on. So it's a really simple mechanism, nothing fancy. It's just titrating out the repressor. So IBP is a repressor of late transcription. It's in the cell in a fixed amount. As DNA copies increase, there are not enough IBP to bind them, and therefore late transcription is turned on. It's really amazingly elegant and simple. So that's how you get a distinction between early and late. And what is large T doing? Large T is driving DNA synthesis, so large T is involved in turning on late transcription by this indirect mechanism. So here's an overview of the SV40 cycle to put all of this in context. Again, our viral DNA is delivered to the nucleus. It doesn't have any viral protein associated with it. It's got nucleosomes, which came from the cell in which the virus originally replicated. First transcript made, and early transcripts encodes large T protein. So the mRNA is made in the nucleus, comes out in the cytoplasm, and there is large T being made. Now large T needs to go back in the nucleus, so it has a nuclear import sequence. It is gonna stimulate DNA replication. As I told you, it's gonna bind the origin, and next time we're going to talk about that. It's also going to uh, stimulate late transcription uh, by virtue of enhancing DNA replication. And then after DNA synthesis occurs, we then have late transcription. And you can see the early and late phases are shown by this dotted line here. Late simply means we have DNA synthesis, and then we have the synthesis of late mRNAs, which are shown here, that encode the capsid proteins. You can see there, VP1, 2, 3, and 4. They also have to go back in the nucleus as well and encapsulate the DNA genome, which then uh, leaves the cell. So early and late phases, again, to delay the synthesis of structural proteins until there's enough DNA that can be encapsulated. So that's a pretty simple scheme that gives you a sense for uh, this kind of regulation, how it occurs, and for what reason. Let's get a little more complicated now. Next one is adenovirus. So this is a bigger genome, 35 to 40 kilobases of linear double-stranded DNA. And here we have three phases in the regulatory program. You can see the timeline at the top. We have immediate early, then we have early, and then late. Again, the distinction between the too early and the late is DNA synthesis. Late is always when DNA synthesis begins. And here we have three viral proteins that are involved. Uh, and that govern these transitions, E1A, E2, and 4A2L4. Now, E1A is made first. That's the first mRNA encoding E1A that's made when this DNA gets into the cell. So the E1A promoter is recognized by the cellular machinery. But then E1A is absolutely required for the transcription of, of the E transcription unit, which encodes a number of important proteins. You can see them in the moment. Uh, but they, of course, include the DNA 
polymerase and accessory factors to get DNA synthesis starting. Now, what E1A does is really interesting. I'm going to show you that mechanism in a moment. It frees up a cellular transcription protein called E2F that's needed for the activity of the E promoter. E2, in turn, the E2 protein, which is made from the early region, uh, that's needed for DNA synthesis. It's needed for entry into the L phase. And it increases the initiation of all the late messenger RNAs, of course, that can give you all the structural proteins that are needed. And 4A2, uh, another early protein, enhances late gene transcription. So three different proteins. Let's take a look at this. Uh, first, what's the role of E1A? This is interesting right now, but as we move into the second half of the course, when we start to talk about transformation and oncogenesis, this will become even more interesting. And then in the last lecture, when we talk about viral gene therapy, it'll really become interesting. So I'm going to give you a teaser. So you stay with us to the end. So here we have the adenovirus E1A proteins. Remember, the genome comes in the cell. E1A is that first mRNA made. And here it's shown uh, in purple. Now, to get E2 transcription, that's what you need E1A for. So let's say this is uh, the adenovirus genome, and that's an E2 promoter in orange. The uh, E2 promoter requires cellular transcription proteins called E2Fs. They're shown in peach here. And the problem is, in an uninfected cell, these E2Fs are bound up to a protein called RB, retinoblastoma. This is going to become really interesting, too. It was discovered, this gene was discovered originally in kids with retinoblastomas, tumors of the eye, because it's deleted or mutated highly in those tumors. It turns out it binds E2F. When E2F is bound to RB, you can see sitting on the E2F promoter site, the promoter doesn't work because RB recruits histone deacetylases to the promoter. So RB is like a coactivator. It's not binding DNA, but it's recruiting other proteins to regulate transcription. Histone deacetylases take acetyl groups from histones, and that makes the DNA wrap more tightly around the nucleosomes. So transcription is shut off. So that's what RB does. It recruits HDAX. The HDAX deacetylate the DNA in this area, so the RNA polymerase cannot work. So this is where E1A comes in. E1A binds RB. It pulls it off the promoter. So now we have E2F, which breathes a sigh of relief. And now it can stimulate transcription at the E2 promoter. So that's why E1A is absolutely needed. Presumably, this is because uh, E2, the E2 promoter is going to be much more active than the, the early, the immediate early promoter can be. So we just kick start it and then we turn on a, a real promoter. And the mechanism is very interesting. It binds uh, RB and it allows transcription. So it, we go from an inactive E2 promoter to an active one. So again, E2F is a cellular transcription factor. It's actually a family, which is what the F means. It was originally discovered by studying adenovirus infected cells, it was discovered to be important, essential for transcription of the E2, this, the early unit, the early transcriptional unit. It was later found to be a family of proteins involved in the cell as well in many interesting processes. So that's an example of a coactivator that doesn't bind DNA but still can regulate transcription. So here is the adenovirus genome, just to show you how complicated it is. Double-stranded DNA, again, 36,000 bases long. And we have uh, proteins at either end. TP is a terminal protein. This is a primer for DNA synthesis, as we'll see later. And then these green things are all messenger RNAs, actually pre-mRNAs, that are made off both strands. So there's highly efficient use of the DNA uh, transcripts are produced from both DNA strands. You can see on the, on the top strand, you have a variety of mRNAs. Here on the left, E1A. That's the mRNA for E1A, which is immediately made when this DNA comes into cells. So E1A is that early mRNA, and it, the protein is needed to get uh, activity at the E2 promoter, which is on the other strand down here. See? Here's uh, 
an E2, that's one E2 transcript. And you can see uh, the, the DNA polymerase is encoded there and a DNA binding protein, which is needed for DNA replication. And then we have a bunch of RNAs with L in front of their name. Those are the late mRNAs. And you can see they're mostly encoding structural proteins. The penton base, the core proteins, the hexon to make up the capsid, protease, and so forth. So fiber gene is over here. And those don't get expressed until DNA synthesis occurs, which depends on all the other steps that we've talked about. So let's put it into perspective in an infected cell. This looks complicated, but it really isn't. We have immediate early, early and late phases. Uh, the virus comes in, the DNA goes into the nucleus. First mRNA made is E1A, goes out in the cytoplasm. E1A is made, that goes back in the nucleus. Uh, that frees up E2F and that activates uh, the E2F promoter. Now we have synthesis of early E2 mRNAs uh, and they go out into the cytoplasm. They encode the DNA polymerase, the DNA binding protein, what you need to get DNA synthesis going. And then once DNA synthesis begins, that, is in the, that defines the late phase. Uh, some of the other proteins that are made activate the uh, transcription of mRNAs that produce structural proteins, as you can see here. At the same time, the genome is replicating in the nucleus, and eventually uh, the DNAs are packaged into new virus particles. So again, a nice orchestration. This is cascade regulation to make sure you make the right proteins at the right time. And one more, just to take it even more complicated, but this is probably not as complicated as it gets. Some of those giant viruses must have amazing transcriptional cascades. This is herpes virus regulation. And so we have also, like adenovirus, three phases, immediate, early, early, and late. But here there's a twist, which I think is really interesting. That immediate early promoter doesn't work really at all when the DNA gets in the cell. So the viral genome is accompanied by a viral protein. And it's shown here as VP16. Now remember, herpes viruses are enveloped viruses. And inside of them is a nucleocapsid. It is a capsid with DNA in it. It's a substructure, so it's a nucleocapsid. Between the nucleocapsid and the membrane, you can see lots of uh, squiggly things on this picture. Those are actually proteins of various sorts. And one of the proteins in there in that area between the capsid and the membrane is called VP16. VP16 is essential for the activity of that early, immediate early promoter. Promoter will not work without VP16. If you make viruses lacking VP16 and you infect cells, they don't replicate because that immediate early promoter does not work. Immediate early promoter makes uh, a protein called ICP0, which is essential for activation of the early promoter. The early promoter produces replication proteins, very much like adenovirus, which activates DNA replication. And then we get into the late phase uh, where we make structural proteins. So really similar to adenovirus, except I think this added twist of incorporating a protein needed for promoter activity uh, is really interesting. So let's see how that looks in the infected cell. Again, these are envelope viruses, and they in fact fuse at the plasma membrane. And that releases the capsid into the cytoplasm. The capsid goes and docks on the nucleus. The DNA comes out of that portal into the nucleus. Now, if it were just naked DNA, the promoter would never work. That immediate early promoter would never work. But you can see these little dots coming out at the membrane as the um, viral membrane is fusing. Those are proteins. And among those is VP16, which gets into the nucleus. It has an import sequence. And that activates that immediate early promoter. It's just a protein that, of course, goes into a complex with the RNA polymerase and other transcriptional factors, but it allows the cell to recognize uh, the immediate early promoter. You make that immediate early RNA. It's translated in the cytoplasm, uh, goes in, and activates the early promoter, the E2 promoter. Uh, that's transcribed into proteins that are needed for DNA synthesis. They go back in the nucleus. They replicate the genome. That's what this means, concatomeric DNA. When the DNA replication begins, you have late mRNAs made. They encode structural proteins, which can then encapsidate the virus particle. And, we'll talk, and for all these viruses, we're going to talk about DNA replication and encapsidation 
uh, separately. But I wanted to give you a sense of how these phases are coordinated from a very simple one all the way up to multifaceted regulation. Our next question is, adenovirus E1A protein stimulating expression of E2 protein, which stimulates expression of 4A2 and L4 protein, is an example of a negative autoregulatory loop, repression of gene expression, cascade regulation, dimerization. Okay, most of you got cascade regulation, which is correct. <clears throat> it's not a negative loop. Uh, it's not repression, but it is cascade regulation. Now let's talk a little bit about RNA processing. And one of the things I want to talk just a bit about is the five prime cap. We've mentioned this before as being an essential part of messenger RNAs. Now in our scheme on the left here of transcription, the cap is put on very early. In fact, after about 20 bases are synthesized. And so the remaining RNAs are all capped. This is a cap structure on the right hand side here. And so here is base one of the RNA, base two. You can see those are joined by typical five to three prime phosphodiester bonds. There's a single phosphate in between. The cap is unusual. It's a base here at the, the very five prime end, just like these are bases. But it's attached in a five to five prime direction, not a five to three prime direction. And they're all three phosphates are left here. It's not a single monophosphate. Uh, in addition, these bases are typically methylated. You can see the methyl groups are highlighted in yellow, both on the cap and the first two bases. Both the cap and the methylation are important for efficient translation of these mRNAs. They can regulate stability of the mRNAs and many other features as well. So these are a really important feature of uh, mRNAs. Capping occurs co-transcriptionally. The DNA is engaged by the polymerase complex. Uh, it makes about 20 to 30 nucleotides, and then the capping enzyme engages the polymerase, uh, and the capping enzyme puts a cap on the nascent RNA. So it waits until there are 20 to 30 bases of RNA made, made and then uh, it is capped. The reason this is done probably, polymerase often stalls and falls off after 20 or 30 bases or so. so uh, if you cap something that's going to be wasted, that's not a good investment of resources. So the idea is that this gets done only when it's clear that an RNA, a full-length RNA, is going to be made. The, the other end of the molecule, we need to polyadenylate. And I, tell, I show you this simply as a contrast for how polyadenylation happens in RNA viruses like we talked about last time. Again, polyadenylation, like capping, happens in the nucleus. It happens post-transcriptionally. That is, we make a full messenger RNA. So we're looking at the very three prime end of an mRNA. There's already a cap way at the five prime end. Here's the three prime end. Transcription has stopped. And then a sequence is recognized uh, just upstream of the three prime end. It's called a poly A addition site. It has a very specific sequence. It is bound by a protein, which then recruits other proteins that cleave at that site and add poly A. So the point here is that it's a post transcriptional event specified by a sequence right there near the three prime end, A, A, U, A, A, A. If you change that sequence by mutation, you will not get polyadenylation. You don't need to know this mechanism, only to know that it's post-transcriptional and depends on a sequence near the three prime end of the RNA. These, these poly A's are about 200 bases long. And of course, they're also important for efficiency of translation. So here's a nice summary of the addition of poly A to viral RNAs, including the RNA viruses last time, our DNA viruses today. The DNA viruses, the polydenylation is post-transcriptional, as I've said. You get cleavage of the pre-mRNA followed by addition of poly A by a separate enzyme, the poly A polymerase. This is a cellular enzyme that carries it out for all of those uh, DNA viruses, including retroviruses as well. And this is in contrast to last time where we saw that polydenylation of RNA viruses occurs during mRNA synthesis. During synthesis, it's not post-transcriptional. So we talked about uh, influenza virus and VSV, where the viral polymerase adds A's by stuttering, reiterative copying of a U-stretch in the template. For VSV, it was between genes. For flu, it was, at, it was when the polymerase complex, you couldn't pull the RNA through it any longer. You get reiterative copying of a U. I didn't mention this last time, but should have. Polio and alpha viruses, 
there's actually a long U stretch at the three prime end of the negative strand that gets copied to poly A, which then gets copied to poly U again and so forth. So that's simply encoded in the genome. The 100 to 200 base poly A is encoded in the genome and it simply gets copied over and over. So there's no reiterative copying. So the distinction here is interesting, cellular enzymes versus viral uh, RNA polymerases. I want to end up by talking about splicing and its value to a viral reproductive cycle. You all know splicing now, it's part of every basic course, but there was a time when we didn't know that sequences were removed from messenger RNAs. Now this scheme at the upper left, the genesis of mRNAs, uh, we know now that intervening sequences are, or introns are removed from pre-mRNAs by splicing. We didn't always know that. And the key was a virus infected cell because it gave the tools to be able to study this process. It was known for a number of years that there were precursors to mRNAs made in the nucleus that seemed to be bigger than the actual mRNA in the cytoplasm. But nobody could figure out exactly what was going on. You can see in this picture, this pre-mRNA was bigger than the ones out here. But as I said, it was really hard to study cellular processes. We didn't have any cloning, we didn't have any tools to be able to do that. But virologists could do it. And a number of groups, two different groups, Rich Roberts at Cold Spring Harbor, Phil Sharp at MIT, they were studying adenovirus and they had the same observation that there seemed to be longer precursors in the nucleus versus the mRNA that came out in the cytoplasm. So they did an experiment which is just, in, in retrospect, it's just beautiful. They took some uh, adenovirus DNA. So they took a piece of the DNA, it was very big, 36,000 bases. So they cut a piece of the DNA and they made it single-stranded by denaturing it. And they picked a piece of the DNA encoding the hexon protein, one of those uh, hexamers that uh, make up the virus capsid. And then they extracted uh, mRNAs from adenovirus infected cells, and they hybridized them to the DNA. Now the mRNAs were polyadenylated, they're in the cytoplasm, so they were mature mRNAs. And this, this duplex that they made, they looked at it in the electron microscope. So you could actually look at it and trace and see what's going on. This is an actual trace of the actual EM photograph. It's a little complicated to interpret, so I've simplified it in the middle. So what they saw was adenovirus mRNA, a linear molecule, but the DNA was very strange. It was hybridizing to parts of the mRNA, but there were these big loops. There were three big loops coming out. And of course, the implication was obvious that the DNA contains sequences that are not present in the final mRNA. And eventually, it was figured out that these are removed by splicing, by a process called splicing, that was then found over the next five years, not only in every DNA virus, but in all of our host cells as well. This is a fundamental process in eukaryotic cells. And this uh, particular adenovirus mRNA, including the hexon, the actual body of the hexon mRNA is shown at the bottom here on the right, it's just the green part. Uh, the rest is mainly intervening sequences in red, in orange and in blue. These are removed by splicing. And then there are three black sequences, very, very short, that are spliced onto the hexon mRNA body. So the actual mRNA is quite smaller than the actual hexon gene. So this was a landmark discovery. Uh, these two investigators, Phil Sharp and Rich Roberts, got the Nobel Prize for this uh, a number of years ago. And of course, many people studied splicing subsequently and learned how it works. And uh, the way splicing works is just amazing. Here at the top is a depiction of sequences from many different pre-mRNAs that have been studied. So over the years, people started sequencing the precursors and the final mRNAs and saying, what's going on here? So at the top, you can see the intron, the intervening sequence that's going to be removed is in pink. The exon is on either side. Those ends are going to be joined together. We have a five prime and a three prime splice site. And look at some of these bases. These are individual bases. And the number is the frequency of occurrence when you compare different mRNAs, different organisms, different viruses. Look at this. Uh, here, that G at the 
five prime splice site, 100% conserved. The next one is also 100%. This A in the middle, which is highlighted in red, 100% conserved. The two bases near the three prime splice site. So people started doing experiments to figure out what was going on. And that's where this cool model comes from. The way this works, shown in part B, you have the pre-mRNA, the hydroxyl of that conserved A residue attacks the phosphodiester bond at the five prime splice site. That forms this looped molecule, still connected to the three prime splice site, but now the five prime splice site has an OH, which can then attack the phosphate again. It releases uh, what's called a lariat. It kind of looks like a, a cowboy lariat, I guess. It's a looped RNA with a long end. And then the two uh, five and three prime splice sites come together. So this was beautifully shown in a number of very elegant experiments. You may be thinking, how does this happen in solution? How do the ends know where to find each other? Well, it doesn't just happen in solution. It happens on an enzyme called the spliceosome. And that's shown here. And again, viral studies contributed a lot to figuring out what was going on here. Spliceosome is a big complex made up of proteins and RNA, and the splicing occurs on it. And that's shown at the top here. On the left, we have our pre-mRNA with the intron. That's the part that's going to be removed. It's in red. These pre-mRNAs in the nucleus assemble on a spliceosome. It starts as a pre-spliceosome and then a spliceosome. But the essential part here, these uh, shadowy things, these spheres, those are proteins. And then the colored molecules, U2, U1, U6, et cetera, those are small RNAs. So the RNA protein complex is the spliceosome. The function of the protein is to provide a scaffold for splicing to occur on. The function of the RNAs to hold the pre-mRNA in place so those reactions that I showed you in the previous slide can occur. And I think you can see there's some base pairings illustrated between these small RNAs and the pre-mRNA there in the pre-spliceosome you can see later on. And that holds the, the pre-mRNA in place. That's why those residues are so conserved. So they can form base pairs with these small RNAs that are part of the spliceosome. And then the, the transesterification reactions occur. Uh, you can see the first one occurring in uh, part three here, the, the A attacking the three prime splice site, uh, and then the release of the lariat intron. So that whole series of reactions is coordinated by uh, the spliceosome. The cool thing about this is you can take away the protein and the catalysis will still work. So the RNA is actually the most important part of the spliceosome. So it, we call it a ribozyme. A ribozyme is an RNA with enzymatic activity. So the active part of the spliceosome are those little uh, RNAs. So because of splicing, you can get lots of different mRNAs made from a viral genome. So let's look at this one. We have on the left, we have a pre-mRNA with two introns. You can see they're in pink. We have three exons, one, two, three, two introns. If you simply take out all the introns by splicing, you get an mRNA, one, two, three. That's called constitutive splicing. There's no regulation of it. You get a protein made from that. But you can do other things with this same pre-mRNA. You could do alternative splicing. You would splice from the five prime site, skip the first intron, the second exon, and the third intron, you would get only uh, one and three as well. So that's called exon skipping. And I think you can just look at this and see that you're gonna get a different protein translated from one, two, three versus one and three. You can do other very interesting things as well. And these are all regulated by small proteins that bind different parts of the pre-mRNA. You can have alternative five prime splice sites. So here at the top, we have a five prime A or B. And if you splice those to, uh, to two, you can get two different kinds of mRNAs made. You can have alternative five prime splice sites. In other words, sometimes the first five prime splice site is attached to the three prime. Sometimes the second five prime is attached to the three prime. Or you can have alternative three prime splice sites. So you can imagine that this gives a lot of flexibility to 
a viral DNA genome. Especially if it's small, you can make lots of different proteins from the same piece of DNA. And that's illustrated here by adenovirus. I just want to show you how amazing this can be. So at the top is the adenovirus genome. And we're looking at the major late promoter there in red. And that leads to the synthesis of the late RNAs, which of course encode the structural proteins. So here is the pre-late mRNA shown at the top. Very, very long pre-RNA. You can see there are lots of introns in it shown by the pink. That pre-mRNA also has five possible polyadenylation sequences. Remember, AAUAAA specifies polyadenylation. L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5 are five different polyadenylation sequences. And you can have alternative polyadenylation besides alternative splicing. So here, the next panel, you have uh, mRNAs that are using each of those five polyadenylation sites. You can see they're longer and longer because they're polyadenylated at different places. And then finally, you have lots of introns left. They can undergo all sorts of alternative splicing reactions. The details are not what's important, but in the end, look at how many uh, mRNAs you can make from, from this single coding region. You have a couple here on the left uh, and a few on the right encoding uh, structural proteins. So at least one, two, three, four, five, six uh, different proteins from this one messenger RNA. So it's really a nice way to not only expand the coding capacity of a genome, but also to be able to regulate its synthesis. You can imagine how alternative splicing could regulate one protein versus another. What statement about polyadenylation of DNA virus mRNAs is correct? A, it always occurs in the cytoplasm. B, it occurs after cleavage of pre-mRNA. C, poly A is added at the five prime end of pre-mRNA and D, it is specified by a stretch of U residues in the template. Well, we have a little confusion here. Half of you got it occurs after cleavage of pre-mRNA, which is correct. It doesn't occur in the cytoplasm. Go, go, go look at one of the figures, clearly in the nucleus. It's not added to the five prime end, right? It's added to the three prime end. But a lot of you picked is specified by a stretch of U residues in the template. That's what RNA viruses do. They stutter at U residues and insert the poly A. The DNA viruses have a polyadenylation signal that specifies cleavage. And then a separate enzyme, the poly A polymerase, adds poly A residues to the end. Splicing is really important for export of RNAs from the cytoplasm. At the top is a pre-mRNA on a spliceosome about to be spliced. Doesn't look like it, but take my word. When these pre-mRNAs are on that spliceosome, lots of little proteins get attached to them, as you may have guessed from the previous slides. And as splicing occurs, a lot of those remain. And funny names here like CBC, SR, CPSF, not important. The important thing is, these proteins, which are stuck on the spliced RNAs, are recognized now by the nuclear export machinery. You may know that there are proteins in the nucleus that um, are needed. They recognize singles, signals on proteins and nucleic acids to ship them out of the nucleus. And so it's these proteins that get on the mRNA by splicing that get it out of the nucleus. Without splicing, very difficult to get an mRNA out of the nucleus. Now this is where viruses come in. It turns out that many viral RNAs have to be unspliced at some point so they make up a full viral genome. Here on the left is a retroviral RNA genome, an RNA. It is often spliced to give rise to smaller mRNAs that can be translated, but eventually the full mRNA has to get out of the nucleus because that's where it's made and it has to go into new virus particles. So how do you get unspliced mRNAs out of the nucleus. Well, viruses, of course, have evolved tricks. And in this case, this retrovirus has at the three prime end a orange sequence called the CTE, or the constitutive transport element. What do you think it does? It binds components of the nuclear export machinery so that it will get out of the nucleus. So on the right is, again, cellular pre-mRNA. The splicing marks the mRNAs for export. 
since the retroviral mRNAs aren't spliced, instead they have a signal that recruits the export machinery, and so it gets exported that way as well. I have one more example of this with HIV. This is, these are these retroviruses with complex genomes. You see they encode a lot of different proteins. Again, this RNA has to be exported unspliced to be put into new virus particles. The problem is it has lots of splice sites uh, in it. So what happens? In this case, it's, it's not just a sequence uh, in the genome. One of the proteins that are made called REV, so this is produced early in infection by extensive splicing of the mRNA. You see you have a small RNA made. It's exported into the cytoplasm. REV is synthesized. It goes back in the nucleus and binds the three prime end of the vial RNA to the REV response element, RRE, and that marks the RNAs for export. So you can now have a full length unspliced HIV RNA exported without splicing, and that can be incorporated into virus particles. So that's a cool way of getting around this requirement for splicing for nuclear uh, export. So as I said, alternative splicing, you get different mRNAs and proteins. You can expand the coding region of a small DNA genome. You can regulate gene expression. Splicing really adds a lot to viral reproductive cycles and to our cells, of course, uh, as well. So today we've talked about the entry of DNA genomes and, and a little bit about retroviral genomes into cells. We've talked about how they have to be repaired in order for that first mRNA to be made. And as I said earlier, every DNA virus has to make at least one protein to start DNA synthesis. That goes for all these configurations here, circular, single-stranded, gapped, linear, double-stranded DNA. And the next time we're going to talk about what that protein does and how it kickstarts DNA replication. <laughs>